Welcome to the show. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. We are now into the third week of the invasion of Ukraine, and Russia is expanding its attacks to new areas, including the city of Dnipro, where airstrikes hit a kindergarten, an apartment building, and a shoe factory. Also in the city of Lutsk, in far western Ukraine, near the Polish border. You can see Lutsk on the left-hand side of the screen here, and Dnipro over on the right-hand side. In the far southeastern corner of the country, country is Maripol, which we've been talking about all week, where the situation now is catastrophic. Russian forces are both surrounding and bombarding the city where residents have not had electricity, heat, or water for days. And now Russian troops are edging closer to the city of Kyiv, raising the question of whether they will try to surround and cut off Ukraine's capital city in the same way they have with Maripol. And Kyiv civilians are digging trenches to prepare for an onslaught, while Ukrainian fighters outside of the city continue to put up a fierce resistance. Meanwhile, the UN says the number of people who fled the country has grown to more than 2.5 million people, or more than one in 20 of all Ukrainians. And more than half of them have gone to the country of Poland, where officials are asking for help in serving the overwhelming stream of people coming in. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber spoke to the founder of an organization helping refugees in Poland. If something doesn't change or if things stay the same, what could the situation look like in two, three weeks? We had this massive solidarity movement for last two weeks, but it will quickly change to anger and people will get angry on Ukrainian refugees because they are poor, because they are, will be homeless, because they will have no jobs. They will take jobs from Polish people. And we already observe right-wing politicians, you know, blaming Ukrainian refugees for what's the situation, right? And Ellison Barber joins us now. Ellison, thank you so much for joining. Lay out for us what is happening on the ground in Poland right now. Hey, Zerlina, we are in Krakow, a city where a lot of people, after they cross the border, are headed to this particular train station. Just look around with me. Remember, it is midnight here, and you see areas, cots laid out, cribs in the train station where families who are unable to find some sort of accommodation shelter in the city are having to sleep. It, is incredibly difficult. We have watched as mothers just keep pushing strollers, pushing their cars, uh, carts, trying to get their children to sleep here. The lights are bright. There are loud noises. But for many people, this is the safest only option they have, at least right now. As we've spoken to volunteer groups in this city, the man you heard from at the beginning of this segment, they talk about how they are concerned that there is not enough of an organized approach from the federal government here in Poland when it comes to aid. They say cities aren't really communicating with each other. A lot of the aid is volunteer led and sort of a minute by minute process. It's working right now a little bit, but we're starting to see some cracks. The mayor of this city in a press conference this afternoon, he talked about how this city is at the limit of their efficiency, he said. They are limited on available housing, available beds, hotel rooms, all the hotels here, they are booked. And there's also a situation where they're concerned about resources just being spread too thin. They already have a large population here they're trying to care for. Add in what they say in this city is 100,000 refugees alone. That strains hospital systems, education systems, work. So there is a, a concern and discussion here locally about what needs to happen to make sure this is sustainable in the weeks and months to come. And we're hearing from volunteer organizations that they feel like there needs to be a more concentrated effort higher up, and they don't feel like they're seeing it right now. Serlina. Ellison, behind you, I, I saw a little boy playing with one of the uh, workers there. Um, and so it put a smile on my face, but also made me deeply sad because uh, you're, you're describing a situation that has been growing increasingly dire over the course of the last couple of days. That NGO representative you spoke with told you there's a lot of solidarity right now for helping these refugees, but he's afraid that will turn into anger. Tell us a little bit more about some of the concerns he mentioned to you in your conversation. 
mean, he was talking kind of big picture about migration policies. He talked about the ones in the United States as well as in Europe. He described some of them as a Trump-like build a wall policy philosophy that he's worried right now there's a lot of support but that as things become more difficult as people realize that maybe this is a crisis that is not going to be quickly resolved that there could be some animosity and then maybe refugees aren't getting the help the assistance that they so desperately need so what he and his group are looking at is how do they take action now to prevent that one thing uh, he talked about and what we've heard from refugees is they're coming to this city and wanting to stay in the bigger cities like Krakow like Warsaw because they are hoping they can go home so they're not wanting to go further into Poland one thing he talked about is hoping to kind of have a more coordinated relocation effort and and even encouraging people he said in the U.S., they should be encouraging their representatives to look at how the U.S. could maybe help to have some sort of relocation assistance for people if this situation isn't something that is quickly resolved and this war becomes a protracted one. Zerlina? NBC's Ellison Barber in Krakow, Poland. Thank you so much for your really important reporting from the ground there where refugees have been streaming in all week. Please stay safe. Joining us now is retired Army Colonel Jack Jacobs. He's a Medal of Honor recipient and an NBC News military analyst. And Colonel, please break down the situation militarily right now on the ground in Ukraine. Well, the Russians, having had uh, little success initially, just walking into Ukraine because there was so much resistance from the Ukrainians, have now decided to conduct a scorched earth tactic. So they're relentlessly bombing and using, uh, bombing civilians using indirect uh, fire means, artillery, multiple rocket launchers, uh, any way they possibly can in order to make life as difficult as possible for the Ukrainians. That is, that is going to result almost undoubtedly in the complete isolation of the major cities, which will be laid siege. And then the link up of Russian forces that skirt the cities from the north and from the south in order to isolate the Ukrainian army in the east. Uh, the result is going to be more carnage. Uh, we have to remember that uh, uh, Putin is doing whatever he can in order to achieve his goal, which is to take over all of Ukraine. And though he was initially stymied because his forces were inept, uh, they used the, the the worst possible tactics going down a main supply route without any without any uh, 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 security on either flank, which slowed them down because they were attacked by Ukrainians, and has now decided that it doesn't matter what he does as long as he achieves his objective, and that means uh, a brutal, unrelenting bombardment of the civilian population of Ukraine. It's only a matter of time before even more people are killed. And uh, the countries in the West that are like Romania and Poland who are receiving refugees are going to be are going to be uh, overflowing with refugees and won't be able to care for them. We originally thought two to four million refugees. It's obviously going to be much more. And the really bad news is those who can't get out of Ukraine are mm -hmm. likely to wind up killed uh, by the Russian by the Russian forces, Zelina. We were talking earlier in the week about the difficulties and obstacles for people with disabilities, also the elderly having such difficult time um, escaping to safety. In terms of um, what we've been t paying attention to, you laid out a number of different ways in which the Russians strategically have adjusted to try, um, you know, to to get back to, I think, what their goal is, as you said, to take over Ukraine. But in terms of the progress from the Ukrainian side, why is it that they've been successful in slowing the Russians down? And are there things they could continue to do in the next few days here to expand on that success? Or are you predicting it will get more brutal from the Russia side of things? Well, I think it's going to get more brutal. There's no doubt about that, because I think Putin is not going to rest until he will have secured the entire country. But there are two reasons why the Russians have been slow to uh, to achieve their obje objectives. The first is uh, the the bravery of the Ukrainian people. There's uh, there's no doubt about it. They want to defend their country and they're going to do whatever they can in order to do it. 
There have been a lot of sacrifices on the Ukrainian side, and all to protect their country and their people. So that's been, uh, that has thwarted that resilience, that leadership by Zelensky has thwarted the Russian attempts to quickly take over Ukraine. The second reason that it hasn't been quicker is that the Russians themselves are uh, very poorly led and poorly trained, particularly not down at the lowest possible levels, at the tactical level, mm -hmm. at the bottom of the food chain. But we're talking about at mid-level, at the level of lieutenant colonels, colonels, and general officers who clearly have no idea whatsoever what they were doing. I mean, take what we were talking about earlier as an example. It, you decide that you're going to attack in the mud season when everything on either side of roads is nothing but mud. And then you send an enormous convoy down a road with no security on either flank. And it's astonishing that, uh, that the Russian officers, who should have known better, decided that they were going to do that. Uh, it, we, in the United States and in the West, we teach really young soldiers not to do that. The Russian generals decided to do that. And it's not surprising, therefore, they were stymied, slowed down uh, by the Ukrainians, who, armed with anti-tank weapons, uh, managed to completely eliminate formations of uh, Russian tanks and armored vehicles, slowing everything down still further. Uh, it's almost as if the Russians themselves learned absolutely nothing from their own defense of their own country, particularly mm -hmm. Stalingrad, for example, uh, during the Second World War, when the, when the Germans tried the same thing and the Russians repelled them. The, Ru the Russians do not remember anything that happened, evidently, tactically, uh, in the Second World War and are paying the price for it. Zelina? In terms of uh, their progress, though, since they've been slowed down, what's your prediction in terms of when they get to, to Kiev or to the center um, of the capital city? I mean, is that in a couple of days, a week? Do we not know because it's already been so unpredictable and you, and you can't make that assessment? Well, we don't know for sure. By the way, as an aside, let me tell you that the Ukrainians are getting a great deal of intelligence inf information from the West. Mm. And that's one of the things that's making them so as successful as they are, that in their in, indomitable spirit. The Russians can do two things. Uh, they can either try to invade directly into the large cities like Kiev, uh, or they can isolate them uh, and wait them out and skirt, uh, uh, avoid them, skirt around them and link up and uh, bifurcate the country. Uh, it, it's it's not entirely clear what they want to do, and it's possible they themselves haven't decided yet what they want to do. Don't forget the decision making on all this is back in Moscow, uh, and they're in a bubble, as we've discussed many times before. So it's difficult to say whether or not they have the kind of information they need in order to make reasonable tactical decisions. But the likelihood is that this is going to be long and drawn out, and even if they isolate large cities and lay siege to them, it's going to be a long, long time uh, before there's any resolution of this problem. And in the interim, there'll be lots and lots of deaths, particularly among the Ukrainians. Colonel Jack Jacobs, thank you so much for helping us understand the latest. Please stay safe. Have a great weekend. Coming up, the parents of Trevor Reed, the former U.S. Marine currently imprisoned in Russia, will join me to talk about their increasingly desperate mission to bring their son home as relations between the United States and Russia unravel. We'll be right back. Right now, there are three Americans detained in Russia. One of them is former Marine Trevor Reed. The 30-year-old was detained in Russia in 2019 on charges of assaulting a police officer and was sentenced to nine years in prison a year later. Reed and his family have denied the charges, and the U.S. ambassador to Russia has called the evidence flimsy. But, it, but as Russia's invasion of Ukraine continues to escalate, there are new concerns about Reed's health as the U.S. and Russia are at odds over the invasion. Joining me now are Trevor Reed's parents, Joey and Paula Reed. First of all, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Paula, I want to start with you. How is your son Trevor doing? And when was the last time you spoke with him? 
Uh, we actually got to speak to him this morning. Um, he's not doing well. He's still coughing uh, blood. He's got a fever off and on. He um, has headaches and um, he has what he thinks might be a broken rib. Um, so he actually is gone to the hospital today, well, to another prison with the hospital in it. We don't know that they'll actually do any treatment there. We're hoping that they will, but he's wanting to be tested for tuberculosis and have that uh, rib x-rayed. Joey, do you have any idea how he managed to break a rib and end up in this condition while in prison? Uh, well, he's been in solitary confine for, confinement for most of the last seven months, but a, a few weeks ago, for some reason, they've allowed him to stay in the barracks, even though he refuses to work. Uh, he said something fell on him off a shelf, uh, so we don't know what that means, but he said that uh, now with all of his coughing, coughing up blood, that now he, it feels like he's being stabbed every time he coughs. And how have his conditions, you mentioned he's been in solitary confinement, how long um, has he been in solitary confinement? Well, since he got there like June 17th or 18th, I mean, sorry, July of last summer, uh, they were keeping him in solitary confinement for 14 to 21 days at a time. And then they would allow him into the barracks for a day or two. Then they would bring false charges against him again and put him back in solitary. About three months of that, he had a roommate. And the rest of the time, he's alone in a small room, hole in the floor for a toilet, uh, and uh, untreated water out of a faucet, and he had to curl up around a hot water pipe to stay warm during the day. That's incredibly hard to hear. And Paula, in terms of the, the invasion, we've been talking the last two weeks about all of the developments on the ground. What were you thinking when you saw the invasion begin? I mean, did, did you fear that your own son would be put in more danger than he already is? Uh, yes, we were concerned that it would cut off the communication lines, even though we've been told all along that they travel on separate tracks. But it's hard to believe that when you're watching the news all day and you see something like that happen. So we were disheartened, of course, when the invasion took place. And um, we don't know what's going on with the, any negotiations, if there are any. And Paula, you were able to speak with President Biden. Tell us how much how you got in touch with the president and, and what happened during that conversation? How did it go? Well, we had been asking for a meeting with President Biden for a couple of months. And when we found out that he was going to be in Fort Worth, we asked if we could meet with him in Fort Worth somewhere for just 10 minutes or so, so we could talk to him about Trevor. And um, we were told mon Monday morning that that could not happen because they didn't have enough time on the schedule. So since it's only about 45 minutes from our house, we made some banners and signs and we went there and we waited for the motorcade to pass by. So when the president came in, um, he saw our signs and he acknowledged me and he made a wave and a, a point. So then um, as we were waiting for him to come back out, um, the phone rang and it was him. It was a White House and he talked to us. So he just said that he thinks about Trevor every day. He prays for Trevor and he, he knows that what we're going through must be hell. And um, he doesn't want us to think that it's not something he doesn't think about all the time. And that when he got back to uh, D.C. that night, he would um, ask his staff to start making preparations for us to have a meeting with him. And Joey, your son is one of three Americans detained in Russia right now. Um, there was news breaking earlier this week about WNBA star Brittany Griner, um, who's also uh, incarcerated and in custody in Russia. I mean, from, from what you know about her arrest, are you skeptical about the charges, given the fact that you mentioned uh, Russia has previously fabricated things against your son? Yes, all I can say is that uh, we know in our son's case uh, for a fact, and, and I'm not taking this third hand, I spent 14 months in Moscow uh, working with the attorneys in the embassy and attending all tri uh, hearings, trial hearings. Uh, the, it's nothing but lies. And from Paul Whelan's family, uh, we heard the same thing. So it would not surprise us if, uh, if charges were false against any American in Russia. And in terms of the process to free your son, I mean, how, how do you predict that it, w it will be more complicated and, and another 14 months? Or do you get the sense that this could be a streamlined process now that you're in direct communication with the White House and president? Well, 
uh, we've said all along, we believed if we met with the president, we could we could uh, accomplish uh, a trade or whatever the Russians need to get, you know, to get this accomplished. But obviously, with all the sanctions and things that are going on, uh, that may be more difficult. Um, but uh, it appears that a lot of the problem all along has been our own government. It's been uh, people at the highest levels not wanting to make a trade or deal with Putin at all while our loved ones are, are dying in Russian gulags. And so we're very frustrated about that. And we believe that the president will try and fix that solution once we once we talk to him. The parents of Trevor Reed, Joey and Paula Reed, thank you both for being here today. It was um, I, I just. My heart goes out to you both. Um, and as you describe the process of trying to free your son, um, it's so incredibly hard to hear, but your dedication is inspiring. And I hope, I hope that you're able to reunite with him safely. Joey and Paula, again, thank you so much for being here. Thank Please you stay for safe. having us. Very much. Coming up, President Biden announces he's calling for ending normal trade relations with Russia, joining the EU and other industrial nations. But what does this actually mean? That conversation after a quick break. But first, the story I'd be remiss to not mention. Two years ago today, on March 11, 2020, the World Health Organization declared COVID, quote, could be characterized as a pandemic. And little did we know what we were in for. These are photos from New York City two years ago today. The subways, completely empty. And life as we knew it was about to change quite drastically. The past few years have been incredibly difficult for myriad reasons. There have been countless periods of grief and isolation and even paralyzing anxiety at times about whether loved ones are safe and healthy, about job security, about what risks are worth taking and which aren't. The long-lasting impact on every single one of us, mentally and physically, has yet to be fully acknowledged, although it really should. And even though much of society has now been telling us that it's time to move on, that the pandemic is in the rearview mirror, many health experts and scientists warn we are certainly not out of the woods yet. Pro tip. So as we near 1 million COVID deaths just in the United States alone, and as we acknowledge that the actual amount of deaths here in the United States and across the globe are likely far undercounted, it's also important to acknowledge all of this loss is tremendous. And the grief is raw and totally real. And we should all take just a little bit of time to reflect on what this two years has meant for each and every one of us. We'll be right back. Today, the West took another step to further isolate Russia from the international community. President Biden announced efforts in coordination with our EU and G7 allies to make it harder for Russia to do business with other countries. Each of our nations is going to take steps to deny most favored nation status to Russia. It's going to make it harder for Russia to do business with the United States and doing it in unison with other nations to make up half of the global economy will be another crushing blow to the Russian economy. It's already suffering very badly from our sanctions. Revoking that status means the U.S. and our allies will be able to raise tariffs on Russian goods. It requires action by Congress, but members on both sides of the political aisle have signaled an eagerness to do so. On top of that, our international allies are working to deny Russia the ability to borrow money from multilateral institutions like the World Bank and International Monetary Fund. The president banned the import of Russian seafood, liquor, and non-industrial diamonds, a move that the White House says will deny Russia more than $1 billion, with a B, dollars in export revenue. Joining me now to break this down, to help us understand it all, is Emily Kokrese. She's the director of the Energy, Economics, and Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. So break down for us what exactly favored nation status means and how significant it is for Russia to no longer have it. Yeah, it's a complicated question. And, you know, it might be easiest to start with what, what didn't happen today. We did not kick Russia out of the World Trading Organization today. But we did take steps that practically will have pretty much the same effect when it comes to Russia's trade relationships with the major economies. Most favored nation status, besides 
something like a very weird term to use with Russia these days. Uh, you know, it is a legal term that means the bedrock of the WTO system to liberalize trade. It means that the U.S. offers low tariff or zero tariff rates to any other WTO member. It's how the WTO liberalizes trade and creates a free trading system. By revoking that, we're essentially saying we're going to slap a whole bunch of tariffs on Russia as part of the overall effort to punish, uh, punish them and hopefully uh, change their political calculus when it comes to further actions in Ukraine. How are these different from, you know, the economic sanctions we've been talking about for the last two weeks that Russia has been hit with, um, that President Biden has been coming out and dutifully announcing? I mean, what's the difference between those sanctions and this? This is really getting at Russia's uh, exports directly to the United States. A lot of the measures we've taken so far have been hitting at their uh, Russia's ability to conduct monetary policy, their ability to engage with the international financial system, uh, their ability to do business based on U.S. dollar assets. This is kind of taking the other side of that trade flow and saying, you're also not allowed into our domestic economy. Interesting. OK, so I see how this is put together like a little puzzle here. In terms of the negotiations, are things, are puzzle pieces like this helpful in use for, you know, like bargaining chips down the road if Vladimir Putin and Russia come to the negotiating table? Are these the kinds of things that can be used as, as chips as the negotiations take place? Absolutely. And, you know, and in some ways, uh, what happened today, on top of all of the other sanctions that we've had, economically, the impact of this is not going to be as biting. Um, as, for example, the central banks that were issued a week or two ago. Um, this move uh, diplomatically and historically is really significant. We're basically saying that Russia no longer has a seat at the table in these kind of foundational international economic institutions. Um, that's a political move in addition to an economic move. Uh, so I don't think we're anywhere close to actually having a political settlement at this point, unfortunately, just given conditions on the ground and given Putin's intensification uh, of the fight in Ukraine. Uh, but absolutely, once we do get to that point where we can negotiate on, on, on a settlement, a political settlement, led by, of course, President Zelensky uh, and what he thinks is best for his country, of course, you would expect something like this to, to be on the table um, as part of an overall settlement, which, unfortunately, again, I don't, I don't think we're close to at this point. You mentioned at the beginning that favored nation status is a little bit complicated. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't imagine that if you walk up to five people on the street in Moscow and you ask them, you know, what do you think about Russia losing this designation? What do you think about it? Um, they would even know what you're talking about. Which side of this, the sanctions or this designation, are more likely to be felt by an ordinary Russian walking around, living their life? Um, you know, economic sanctions take time. Are ordinary Russians able to feel either of these puzzle pieces? Yeah, it's a good question. And, you know, you're right. I think the, the actions that have been taken previously probably are more likely to be felt by, by average Russians. You know, you've got inflation rising in the country. Uh, you've got many Western brands, including really popular Western brands like uh, Apple pulling out of the Western market. Those are the really tangible sorts of impacts that your average Russian citizen are going to feel uh, much more heavily. I think you know, revoking MFN, revoking most favored nation status, that's really going to affect bigger companies. It's going to affect those companies uh, and their employees that are trading on global markets, particularly in the energy markets. Um, you know, and so that is a little bit more abstract. Um, it adds to and accelerates kind of the economic pain. Um, but this is probably not the one uh, that Rush and every everyday Russian citizen would, would look at and be like, that's the one that really made us mad at Putin. I hate to say it, but I, it's probably the Netflix. <laughs> um, or the gaming servers, right? Um, let, let's just be real about it for a second. Um, so what additional economic sanctions are even possible at this point? I feel like every single day I'm opening up my phone and there's a new sanction or some new economic um, piece of the puzzle, as we're, we're, we're now describing it, that, that the president or allies are putting on to Russia. But what's left? I mean, is there anything else they could do? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, we've used a lot of the big hammers, uh, particularly when it comes to the U.S.-Russia economic relationship. I mean, there's really no trade and investment that's, that's happening anymore, particularly since we already took energy off the table uh, through the, the ban on energy imports earlier this week. Um, so I think the, the hard next step here is going to be trying to tackle uh, Europe's energy relationship with Russia. I think there's going to be a heavy diplomatic effort there. Um, I don't think you'll see a new sanction from the United States there because we've already done that. 
Um, but we do need to put a lot of effort into uh, giving Europe the capability over the coming three months, six months, next year even, uh, to cut off their own energy supply. So I think that's going to be a heavy focus. I also think we're going to see a lot of action on enforcement. There's been a lot of talk about making sure that crypto exchanges can't be used for sanctions evasion. So I think we'll be shifting a little bit in terms of uh, enforcing and intensifying the sanctions that we already have in place to make sure they're biting, to make sure they're effective, to make sure there's no evasion. Well, this was a fascinating conversation about economic sanctions, and I feel like I now understand this much better than I did before we, we chatted. So I hope everybody at home feels the same way. Emily Kilcrease, thank you so much for explaining this to me. What is the, the quote from Philadelphia that Denzel says, like, I'm a third grader? <laughs> thank you so much for, for making that digestible. Please stay safe. <laughs>
you know, if things are going to go to court, there has to be a gathering of evidence, and there's a whole sort of set of rules about the gathering of evidence. Um, but at this point, we're, we're mostly talking about, you know, there's um, obviously there's there's a lot of um, images that that show what is this, what has happened, but there's um, the the idea of intent that has to be proved, and so there's a whole lot of um, sort of investigation that comes along with this. I think what we have right now is a lot of really concerning activities that may indicate okay. that they have been committing war crimes. Um, and so certainly an investigation is warranted at this point. Um, but I think what we're really arguing about now, and this, I think the clip you showed at the UN was um, really, it's emblematic of that, is we're arguing about the narrative. Um, the Russians want to portray this as a war essentially uh, you know, uh, freeing Ukraine um, from denazifying, as it, as it called it. Um, and they don't want the information out there that they're specifically targeting civilians. Um, that destroys their ability to control the information space. And so the U.S. right now, I think, is doing a great job of combating that, um, to put that information out there, to show that those are lies and this, the narrative that they're pushing is absolutely false. Um, and so they understand clearly what their true intentions are. What does an investigation into war crimes actually look like? Um, it, it comes in all, all sorts. I mean, there's obviously some of the more famous ones were after World War II and the Nuremberg trials. Um, but even taking more recent events, there's individuals now, um, say, in Syria, who are trying to um, gather evidence, um, who are trying to document uh, war crimes. And they're trying to kind of put it into a you know, repository, so with the hope of eventually having some sort of tribunal or some sort of trial. Um, and that's really what this is about. I mean, there's, if you look through, you know, whether it be at the ICC, um, which is really more for individuals, or the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, which is more about for states, um, this is really going to be sort of a long-term project. Um, it's not likely that, that Putin is going to be in shackles anytime soon and going to be taken to The Hague. Um, this is really about how do we document these and so that if at some point down in the, in the very far future, um, we're able to, um, you know, have a sort of a truth commission or something comes out that talks about exactly what happened during this. So it has to be accumulated now, that information, um, for evidentiary reasons. Um, otherwise, it'll be lost. Um, but this isn't something that's happening in the near term. When you listen to the Biden administration, with the exception of UN Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, um, they don't accuse Russia directly of war crimes. Why do you think that is? I think they're trying to walk a very fine line here. Um, they want to obviously stop the invasion, um, but they also want to look for some sort of off ramp for Putin. Um, and so, um, talking of war crimes, um, that it's you know a full court press from the entire administration, in many ways, could box Putin in to feeling like he he has no off ramp. So why not double, triple down, and just scorch the entire earth in Ukraine? What is there to lose? Um, if essentially he's going to be, um, you know, attempt, they're going to attempt to prosecute him. So I think they're trying to walk a fine line, obviously not excuse um, any of the behavior um, by any means, um, and, and they do want to hold him accountable. But I think they're also very realistic that at this point, it's how do we stop the suffering? How do we stop the attacks? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then at some point, um, try to make sure that we're documenting them and try to hold people accountable. Um, but I think kind of stopping the, the literal bleeding at this point um, is really where they're focused, and, and that's where they should be focused. Is there a precedent for successfully stopping these types of uh, the intentional targeting of civilians in the middle of the invasion um, that you can point to in recent history? I think it's very difficult um, to, to do that, I, it's especially in this particular circumstance where I think this is frankly part of the of the of the playbook that, that Putin has established. You know, he is he has a intelligence background, and so the idea of sort of destabilizing a country versus kind of straight um, sort of typical military victories. That's it's. He's looking at this in a very different way, and so pushing the population out, removing them, um, in some ways, is, is a win for him. He wants the territory for strategic depth, essentially. You know, to, in order to uh, get depth for the country and sort of be more defensive. Um, and having the Ukrainians leave and causing a refugee crisis throughout Eastern Europe um, that NATO and other um, organizations have to deal with um, is something that would be helpful to him for his, as despicable as it is, um, be helpful for him for his geopolitical goals. It may be too early to use this word, but what you're describing is genocide, right? The, the, inten you know, the intentional wiping out. Obviously, you had Ukrainian officials say even today that he's trying to just remove all of the people from Ukraine. Um, is, is it too early to use that word? When would it be appropriate to start using that word? 
I think if we had evidence that there was um, specific plans and intentions in order to remove all you know, ethnic Ukrainians um, from the territory, which I don't believe we have at this point. Um, and I think it gets really uh, confusing and sort of messy. Um, obviously, there's there's Ukrainians who are Russian speaking. There are individuals who feel like they are Russian ethnically, but they are Ukrainian citizens. Um, and so it, I think in terms of uh, you know intentionally targeting Ukrainians and removing them in a, a genocide, I, I don't think we're there yet. Um, and uh, hopefully we don't get to that point. And that's obviously a very different type of, of situation. That's not saying that it isn't part of the, the plans, but I don't think we have the evidence showing that that's happened yet. It's so incredibly hard to talk about this, but I think it's important, as you said, um, for the folks who, who do that work to document all of these atrocities instead of just watching it in horror, uh, make sure that at some point through the formal processes, whether it be the International Criminal Court or some other forum, holding Vladimir Putin accountable for what we're watching unfold. Um, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate you helping us understand all of this. It's Holden Triplet. Please stay safe. My pleasure. Thank you. So Tulsi Gabbard, you know, the 2020 Democratic presidential candidate, combat veteran and former Democratic Congresswoman representing the state of Hawaii. Um, you know, for her, things have shifted quite a bit since her 2020 run. She actually recently spoke at CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Conference, just last month. And now another interesting development I did not want you to miss. I did not want you to miss this. This week, federal prosecutors charged Elena Branson, a dual Russian-American citizen, with illegally acting as an agent of the Russian government in the United States. The Justice Department says Branson, quote, spread Russia's interests, including the lobbying of U.S. government officials in favor of Russian policy positions for nearly a decade. Do you have any guesses as to which federal candidate Branson gave her money to? Tulsi Gabbard. The Daily Beast reports Branson made two donations to Gabbard's presidential campaign in 2019. It's worth noting it wasn't a ton of money. The donations totaled only about 60 bucks. But either way, I think it does raise some questions about why Gabbard piqued that specific person's interest. Gabbard has an interesting relationship with Russia and has had one for many, many years. And let's not forget... Gabbard actually sued Hillary Clinton for defamation in 2020 after Clinton called her a, quote, Russian asset. That lawsuit was dropped months later. What a time. Coming up, while Russia faces pushback for its invasion of Ukraine from most of the world, there's one particular country doing the exact opposite. Up next, a fascinating explainer of China's risky alliance with Russia in a conversation with New York Times diplomatic correspondent Edward Young, who has, a new, who has new reports out of China amplifying Russian disinformation. We will be right back. As most of the world unites around Ukraine, the warming relationship between Russia and China is coming under new scrutiny. In a joint statement early last month, the two described their partnership as having, quote, no limits. Weeks later, when Russia launched this assault on Ukraine, China refused to even call it an invasion. And in recent days, as Russia falsely accused the U.S. of funding secret biological experiments in labs in Ukraine, Chinese diplomats and state media organizations have amplified the unfounded claims in news conferences, articles, and on official social media accounts. Sky News correspondent Tom Cheshire has more about what people in China are being told about the war. China has been trying to take an apparently neutral stance so far, but in its media, one side narrative is being pushed over the other. Here in Beijing, discussion of the conflict is tightly controlled, online and offline. The only messages of support are hung from friendly embassies like Canada's. There are no protests against the war, not just because of China's characteristic control, but also because people have a mixed view of the conflict and who is to blame for it. 
，你不能老是觉得你多少年前你是一个垄断世界。我我觉得也不是俄罗斯的问题，我觉得就是普京的问题，因为就是民众是无辜的嘛，就是如果就是发发起战争的人是有问题。That's partly because they're getting a very skewed version of the war, one where the term invasion is banned. Every day, this giant screen in Beijing shows China's most important daily news bulletin from state broadcaster CCTV. It's almost like they're reporting a different conflict. You don't see any sort of devastation. When you do see it on TV here, it's a very sanitized version. You watch Russians handing out food to Ukrainian citizens. You don't see the cities that they have leveled. This is a big screen, but China is not getting the full picture. Some experts have hoped that China might play a positive mediating role, given its relationship with Russia. What we can do at this present situation. And it is very, very limited. Professor Shi Yinhong has previously advised the Chinese government. It sounds like you're saying China doesn't have that much leverage. China never, in the past, at present, and I believe in the future, and will support Russian military attack against Ukraine, and will support Russians any, you know, adventurist, you know, actions, and to disturb the European situ-、uh, the security. As well as China will never support an American sanctions against Russia. It means that for all Beijing's power and economic might, it has so far been defined by inaction. From the outside, it can look like indifference. Tom Cheshire, Sky News, Beijing. Joining me now to discuss is Edward Wang, diplomatic and international correspondent for the New York Times. So, Edward, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki took to Twitter to address the disinformation Russia and China. We're spreading, tweeting. It's preposterous, and it's the kind of disinformation operation we've seen repeatedly from the Russians for years in Ukraine. And later, saying it's an obvious Russian ploy to justify their attacks on Ukraine. I mean, how does China's role in the spreading of this disinformation stoke the fire here? Well, China has a huge cyber presence. It's got a strong diplomatic standing in the world. So when it chooses to amplify Kremlin propaganda or conspiracy theories, in this case, then that message gets spread around the world. It gets spread among the huge Chinese population,、um, and it gets spread all throughout the internet.、Um, it's boosted、um, in many different ways.、Um, one group found、um, around more than 200 Twitter posts from official Chinese media accounts. Uh, accounts of diplomats or state media organizations that were really pushing this conspiracy theory about bioweapons labs in Ukraine. Does the Chinese propaganda take the same form and language、um, and, and sort of messaging as the Russian propaganda? Is it different? Are there different goals? Or are they simply just amplifying literally what the Kremlin is saying? In a lot of cases, they are amplifying what the Kremlin is saying.、Um, up for the last few weeks of the war, we saw them amplifying a lot of the grievances that Putin and the Kremlin cite. They say that NATO enlargement and NATO expansion towards the borders of Russia were what created the war. They say it was the U.S. that's the real power behind the violence, and that it's up to the U.S. to、um, rein in Ukraine. And to put an end to the war, this has been a very consistent message from China, and it's been following the Kremlin line. Now, this conspiracy theory is a whole different level. This is an actual conspiracy theory about、um, biological and chemical weapons that don't exist, at, that the U.S. has not had any role in manufacturing in Ukraine, that the Ukrainian government apparently doesn't have, and、um, it's something that. The Kremlin、uh, started putting out there on the internet weeks ago.、Um, it amp- it、uh, amplified that in different ways, starting this week with、um, documents that the Defense Ministry and Foreign Ministry put online, and then from the very official heights of the Chinese Foreign Ministry, they started boosting that message、um, with news conferences in Beijing, and then from these social media accounts that I mentioned. Why would Why would China specifically amplify this conspiracy theory about biological weapons? How do they benefit from amplifying that propaganda specifically? There's an interesting backstory to this, which is it allows China. It's sort of a form of revenge by Chinese officials for. 
um, the sort of uh, the unproven theory that the pandemic virus, uh, the coronavirus, spread from a laboratory that was in the city of Wuhan in China. That theory was propagated during the Trump administration, and many high-level Trump officials really pushed that theory. They never had any evidence for it. They said it's purely circumstantial because this lab exists in Wuhan and they're doing research on viruses, then there's a good chance that the virus escaped from that lab and then the pandemic started. Um, science, a lot of scientists have rebutted that and said that unless there's evidence for that, we can't assume that. But China obviously got very incensed by that. And, um, and they started pushing conspiracy theories back in 2020 when they started hearing this message that it was the U.S. military that had brought the virus over to China because um, they were experimenting with um, biochemical weapons here in the U.S., and they point to Fort Detrick in Maryland. So in a way, by now, they're trying to turn the tables now on the U.S. by really um, pushing this new germ warfare theory. The issue of Taiwan has come up um, since the invasion of Ukraine because of China's relationship with Taiwan. Talk about whether or not the invasion of Ukraine is a dangerous precedent and, and the analysis around how China is looking at Russia's behavior in Ukraine and making its own considerations about what it wants to do towards Taiwan. Well, it's very difficult to know what Xi Jinping, the leader of China, is thinking. We do know that he wants to rejuvenate um, the wealth and power of China to bring it back to its state under um, the Qing dynasty or earlier when it was a central power, the central power in Asia and in much of the world. Um, and he and many other Chinese feel that it was Western imperialism that carved up China into different parts and that the weakness of China in the 20th century with different wars led to the dissolution of, um, of the territory of China. So Taiwan's the one remaining piece of territory that China claims that it hasn't gotten back yet. And that's because of, um, of you know, a split that happened during the Chinese Civil War in the 20th century. Um, now, the question of whether what they're looking at, they're looking at the sanctions that the US and Europe have imposed on Russia. And they're thinking, can we, um, is that a cost that we can pay if we try and invade Taiwan? They know that um, huge economic sanctions would be levied. And in Taiwan's case, there is a greater possibility that the U.S. and Asian allies and European allies would go to war to defend Taiwan. There is no treaty with Taiwan, but the U.S. has this posture called strategic ambiguity around Taiwan, which is it doesn't say clearly whether it will come to the military defense of Taiwan or not. And so that's supposed to leave China guessing and be a deterrence measure. And right now, the Communist Party cannot assume that the U.S. will not defend Taiwan militarily. Russia and Ukraine is a different situation because um, they don't, the U.S. doesn't want to get in a NATO war, have NATO get into war with Russia. That's been something they've been trying to avoid. And so um, Biden has said flatly that he won't send troops to Ukraine. That's a really helpful explanation um, as to the similarities, but also the distinctions um, in these two situations. My last question, oh, we don't have time. So that was my last question. Edward Wong, thank you so much for helping us understand this. Um, you know, I feel like throughout tonight's show, I, I learned a lot through each block. Um, and, and that's, I think, the goal of the show. That does it for me tonight. I'm Zerlina. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube. Eamon is up next right here on The Choice from MSNBC. Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.